Hi, it's Tuesday afternoon, November 5th. We're watching Tropical Storm Raphael. This was Tropical Depression 18 yesterday, intensified into a tropical storm, gained the name Raphael, and is now moving just past the western tip of Cuba on its way toward the Cayman Islands and eventually western Cuba over the next 24 hours. As we talked about yesterday, conditions have been broadly favorable for Raphael to intensify, and we have indeed seen steady strengthening since yesterday. If we look at the zoomed-in satellite loop, what you'll notice right away is the strong rotation and spiral bands kind of curling and spiraling inward toward the center. We have a highly banded structure, and you can see many of these spiral bands raking across Jamaica, bringing heavy rains to the region, and you can see that most of them are on the eastern side of Raphael's circulation. The western side, a little bit drier. We've seen a couple of arc clouds forming and pushing off this way as thunderstorms collapse in some of these light bands toward Grand Cayman, indicating that there's some dry air on this side, which has periodically gotten ingested into the inner core and disrupted deep thunderstorm activity in the uh, inner core region, but this hasn't been enough to prevent steady strengthening. This is the radar picture out of Grand Cayman, courtesy of the Cayman Islands National Weather Service. You can see again the tightly coiling rain bands here in the center. We don't really have what looks like a proper clean eye wall just yet, but it is tightly coiled. And this is a structure that can easily continue intensifying, maybe even at a more rapid pace over the remainder of its journey toward Cuba. This is the portion of its track where we're expecting the most intensification of Raphael. And at the moment, its track is probably going to take it closer to Little Cayman than it is to Grand Cayman at this point. So while we will still see elevated winds and rains coming through the Grand Cayman area, the greatest potential for hurricane conditions will be in these other islands off to the east here. This is the latest data from the U.S. Air Force aircraft flying through Raphael. Pressure of 994 millibars, 12 millibars lower than 24 hours ago, and the latest pass found it even several millibars lower than that. You can also see the strongest winds on this northeastern side have come up quite a bit. The National Hurricane Center estimated intensity has max winds of about 60 miles per hour. This latest swath of data, which just came in before I hit record, shows max surface winds approaching more like 70 miles per hour. So that's still below hurricane force, which begins at 74 miles per hour. But this is getting pretty close now and will likely be a hurricane in short order. Again, you can see some of these Cayman Islands here and the track is in the general direction of those two smaller islands might pass just to the west of them. And this will be the strong side of the storm. So expect hurricane conditions if you live here. Talking about Raphael's future, this is the GFS steering flow at 500 millibars, valid right now. So there's Raphael just west of Jamaica. We talked about this ridge to the north of the storm yesterday. So this is east of Florida and is guiding the storm towards the northwest. And for the moment, this is a very straightforward steering pattern. But once it gets into the Gulf of Mexico, things get a little bit more complicated. If I walk this forward, you'll see that the, the track has been consistently forecast to go east of the Isle of Youth and into the thinnest part of the island of Cuba. Havana is right there. And as this crosses into the Gulf of Mexico, it may actually slow down for a little bit, which is a little unusual at this time of year. But what's going on here is if I go back to the beginning, you'll see that there's a shortwave trough over Oklahoma and Texas. This is currently generating a lot of southwesterly mid-level flow out over the western Gulf of Mexico, but this little piece of the trough is going to lift out over the coming two days. And as that exits, you'll see that this allows room for a mid-level ridge to nose in over the southwestern Gulf of Mexico and begin to compete with the ridge east of Florida. So this one has southerly steering flow trying to push the storm toward the north Gulf Coast. This one here has opposite steering flow out of the northerly direction trying to slow the storm down so you'll kind of see that happen here where you'll see this this nosing ridge and this northerly flow and the storm ends up fighting uh, to see which steering flow will win the battle essentially to push the storm in one direction or the other and underneath all of this the surface flow is actually out of the east this whole time so if the storm starts to decouple or fall apart due to shear which we'll talk about in a second that will impart a more westerly component to the storm's motion if it becomes a shallower vortex. If we look at the European model, we'll see the same thing here where this ridge is nosing in and that the European model actually has this one a little bit stronger. So this Western ridge kind of wins the battle a little bit. So on the European, you'll see this turn westward 
You'll see it move almost due west across the Gulf because this ridge is strong enough to prevent the storm from going north. On the GFS, the eastern ridge wins a little bit more, and so it eventually does move north toward the central Gulf Coast. Some of this will come, come down to proximity to, to which ridge. You know, the storm is a little closer to this ridge on the GFS. On the European model, it's just a hair farther west, and it's therefore closer to this ridge, and this ridge ends up having more influence over the storm as a result. Models are still figuring this out. This portion of the journey right here in the central Gulf, very difficult because not only is it the battle of the ridges here, but it's how strong will the storm be? How long will it hold together? It's going to encounter hostile conditions as soon as, soon as it moves north of the latitude of the Florida Keys. Things get much tougher for the storm to hold together. This is the GFS Ensemble Mean Vertical Shear Plot on early Friday morning. You can see where the storm is and you just see the wall of color gradient here. Everything north of here in orange and yellow is a very strong and hostile vertical shear for the storm, which if it moves into that area, it will quickly get decoupled and a convection and thunderstorm activity will be displaced well to the east of the storm center. And that's amplified by the fact that the water is cooling down in the northern Gulf of Mexico. It's nearly winter here. And so this will allow the storm to fall apart more quickly for a given level of vertical shear. And if we look at the modeling, we'll see a pretty consistent story still being told here in terms of the intensity. This is the GFS mid-level moisture plot showing the symmetric ball of green while the storm is south of Cuba at likely peak intensity. When it crosses Cuba, it moves north. And again, we'll have the two ridges kind of fighting for which direction to push it. On the GFS, the eastern ridge wins just enough that the storm does go north. But as a result, it hits that wall of westerly or southwesterly wind shear. And so you see the green get pushed off towards the eastern side of the storm. And this becomes barren and dry. Brown colors mean very little rain, very little thunderstorm activity over the storm. And it dramatically weakens to essentially nothing left by the time it makes it to the central Gulf Coast. On the European model, it's a little different in the sense that the western ridge ends up winning a little bit more. This ridge is just a little bit stronger. The storm is a hair farther west, and so it does not move north as readily as on the GFS. You can see it even move west-southwest on the model, but even still, it's encountering higher shear and dry air here. So most of the green on the eastern side and the storm starts weakening considerably by the time it makes it to the central Gulf of Mexico. There is a world where if the storm tracks over the Isle of Youth instead of east of the Isle of Youth, so it moves a little bit more west in the short term, it could stay farther to the south and just continue into the Western Gulf. Some ensemble members show this possibility. If that were to occur, the storm would remain stronger for a longer time and then end up getting stuck in weak steering conditions here. And at that point, we wouldn't really know where it's going just yet. Uh, but this seems to be maybe more of an outlier solution this morning. A lot of models are taking this east of the Isle of Youth now. The short-term motion of the storm this morning seems to bear that out. And if that happens, it's probably going to make it far enough north that wind shear starts blowing it apart. And then it will eventually find its way north somewhere in here. Couldn't really tell you where exactly, but it would likely be falling apart and weakening considerably by that time anyway which would be great news for the North Gulf Coast. We see this occurring on high resolution hurricane model guidance from NOAA as well. Again, peak intensity east of the Isle of Youth in Cuba on Wednesday morning. And uh, you know, note that on this track too, this wind field is going to impact the Florida Keys. So we do have tropical storm warnings out here, tropical storm force gusts over 40 miles per hour, certainly possible in the Western Keys. Uh, but other than that, a rain uh, event in some of these spiral bands for Florida, not so much a significant wind event. And as this comes up into the Gulf again, it will start falling apart and getting sheared. As you can see, all of the asymmetry developing with the green slash moisture on the eastern side, just like the global models show. And although the system is slow uh, to make its way through the Gulf, it's really not a huge wind threat by the time it makes it closer to the North Gulf Coast. Again, pretty uncertain where here the remnant circulation might make it into the coast uh, but don't expect a big wind event here maybe some showers and the potential for some minor coastal flooding due to elevated onshore flow on the eastern side of this uh, but not expecting a significant event if it moves toward this section of coastline here the gfs ensemble gives a nice picture of the uncertainty this morning you can see that there's kind of a spread about where it crosses cuba and you'll note that the the members closer to the isle of youth or farther west they're the ones that end up staying farther south and turning more westward 
over the central gulf, you'll notice that there's more orange and yellow here indicating stronger storms on those members. So they're farther south, turning west. They stay stronger for longer over warm water and lower shear, but they end, even these members end up encountering the shear later and end up weakening considerably in the western gulf. The majority of the members do what I just showed you on most of the modeling is they make it far enough north to actually turn toward the central gulf coast and you'll note the colors go from orange and yellow to green and blue indicating a significantly weakening storm on these members as vertical shear and cooler water does its work on the storm so again you know we're kind of looking at this area right now and the national hurricane center forecast is kind of splitting the difference and they're somewhere in here in four to five days uh, it's a little difficult to say with any confidence whether it's going to go west or turn more toward the north but even if it does turn north again not expecting a major event here this is the national hurricane center official forecast this morning you'll see the hurricane warnings out for the cayman islands and western portion of cuba tropical storm warnings for central cuba and the western florida keys including the dry tortugas We'll see this crossing Cuba sometime on Wednesday and then Wednesday evening emerging in the southeastern Gulf of Mexico. You can see the National Hurricane Center showing that slowdown. These dots become more packed together as the storm motion slows and then a turn toward the west followed by an edging back toward the north near the end of the forecast. Again, kind of hedging here because we have models that are going in here and we have models that are going down here. So they're kind of between the two right now but you can also see that they show weakening from the letter H for hurricane to the letter S for tropical storm, showing a weakening system as Raphael encounters more hostile conditions. This is five days out. Keep in mind, this is for the upcoming weekend, several days from now. So expect adjustments to this forecast over the coming days, given that we have a lot of uncertainty with this portion of the storm's future. We're pretty good up to here. Everything after that, some question marks remain, but again, the good news is that if it does approach the U.S. Gulf Coast, the storm is likely to weaken considerably. That doesn't mean that impacts won't be possible, and we could still see impacts from heavy rains, minor coastal flooding, and some elevated tropical storm force winds, uh, but the details on that, pretty hard to figure out at this moment in time. We'll know more in the next day or two. That's it for now. Thanks for watching the video. I'll have another one tomorrow.